the judicial officers, His Excellency Mr. Jules Bijou, Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, His Excellency Mr. David Prendergast, High Commissioner for Jamaica in Port of Spain, Mr. Pablo Solar Salas, Charge Affair of the Embassy of Chile, Ms. Paolo Mosquero Arce, Deputy Head of Mission of the Embassy of the Republic of Colombia, Chief of All First Peoples, Mr. Ricardo Barras, Mr. Val Lewis had some very sincere regrets from the EU Ambassador Bruce Brook, and I mentioned him because he is a previous donor, the EU delegation to the faculty, so he really would have liked to be there, and he wanted me to express that uh, to you. What is the, I am Professor Rosemary Anton, by the way, the Dean of the Faculty of Law. What is the role of a university? Indeed, a leading tertiary institution like the University of the West Indies in a country and a region wanting to make that final leap into meaningful development. I say meaningful because the sustainable development goals that all of CARICOM has embraced close development fully within a human rights veil. This, as Nobel Prize economist Amriata Sen told us long ago, is true development. For myself as dean, from the beginning of my tenure, I have believed that the role of the UE is to provide genuine leadership on the burning social questions of the day. For a faculty of law, that translates into interrogating the legal questions and challenges that inevitably accompany these social issues and to bring direction to future policy and law reform. Our Vice Chancellor, Sir Hilary Beckles, has implored us to be an activist university. It therefore falls to us at the Faculty of Law, St. Augustine, to provide the intellectual space and objectivity of scholarship to confront and challenge the important socio-legal issues of our day, and we are eager to rise to the challenge. The work of attaining societies grounded in fairness, equity, greater social justice, and enhanced human rights is too large and too complex for us to go it alone. Sometimes the UE voices will be dominant in the dialogue. Other times, we share our platform with informed partners and community leaders and subdue our own to allow those vital voices to speak through the weight and gravitas of the University of the West Indies, the leading tertiary institution in the region. Today is one of those days as we collaborate with the UNHRC, the Living Waters, leaders in this area on refugee rights and asylum, attorneys, journalists, and others working on refugee rights. The panel lineup is also very special because pursuant to our policy to involve our accomplished students in our continuing legal education efforts, I've invited the students who worked on this subject in their human rights clinic assignments to represent the faculty on the panel. It is also no accident that we are here today in the most sacrosanct space of justice, the Convocation Hall, working in partnership to address a deeply complex social issue of the day, refugee law, rights of asylum seekers and migrants. This is a subject with deep and varied dimensions involving related rights and freedoms, including economic and social rights. We will explore what is an appropriate legal policy framework for Trinidad and Tobago and the region. We believe that such important issues are best addressed not only by committees and lawyers, but in collaboration with the public. So this is an open forum. Trinidad and Tobago has, it seems, only just woken up to this issue. However, it is not new, either here or the region. We have typically ignored the subject of refugee, asylum, and migrants when it affected our CARICOM neighbors, Haitians, persons of Haitian descent. We also ignored it when it seemed to be only Africans knocking on our doors, as no doubt 
uh, Mr. Schoon will talk about. We were silent when U.S. refugee policy refused Haitians escaping earthquake ravaged Haiti while Cubans received free access. A few years ago, I was serving on Inter-American Commission and was the rapporteur for persons of African descent and against discrimination. During my tenure, the Dominican Republic's Constitutional Court ruled that persons born in the Dominican Republic of Haitian descent were not citizens, making them stateless. Initially, the Commission referenced this as merely a nationality issue. However, I saw it clearly as race discrimination. With the help of the UNHCR, we were able to persuade the Commission to carry out a state visit to the Dominican Republic. What we found there was heart-rending and confirmed our fears, and we did help to bring about a more equitable solution. Soon after, closer to home, the Bahamas, when faced with the same situation, was moving in the identical direction. Once again, the Commission intervened. As a consultant in the Turks and Caicos, I also witnessed the same pattern and so-called belonger laws were deliberately constructed to keep them out. This issue, therefore, has been staring us in the face, and the time is ripe to confront it head on. Now today, the circle has broadened, and we have many Venezuelans. Frankly, we have also had the Guyana issue, but we refuse to even acknowledge it for what it was. I am not a bleeding heart, naive academic. I am aware that there are costs and need for resources. Four years ago, a group of Asian refugees arrived in St. Lucia. The cost to return them were astronomical for a small state. Similar concerns were expressed in the TCI. If we are to adopt appropriate policy as we need to do, there are tangible costs, food, shelter, education, health, and housing. But what about the costs if we do not? The social costs the long-term economic cost for insularity. The ravages of the world displayed on our television screens daily show us clearly the uncertainties. A rich nation today can become a nation of refugees tomorrow. We in the Caribbean should know this from our own history. We have traversed each other's borders, responding to cycles of plenty and hardship accordingly. From time immemorial, my friend Prof. Vereen Shepard reminded us yesterday of Haiti's historical generosity to us 202 years ago, when 15 enslaved Jamaican men made a dash for Haiti, escaping their enslaver, Makwan. Haiti granted them citizenship immediately, no questions asked. In fact, as I was preparing to come here today, I heard on the news that it is the poorest countries that accept the most refugees. Bangladesh was mentioned. History teaches that we were all once refugees and migrants, voluntarily or otherwise. The biblical refrain, do unto others as you will have them do unto you, seems apt on this question of refugees. On my Facebook yesterday, I saw a post with several biblical passages instructing us to treat immigrants well. Cursed be to anyone who deprives the immigrant of justice, Deuteronomy 27, 19. Who knew? Certainly, the concept of asylum, asylum has existed since early civilization. Every major religious group has its own foundation and story of asylum, from Jesus and the Holy Family, to Muhammad's plight, to the exodus of the Jews fleeing the Egyptian pharaoh's order to murder firstborn sons. Personally, I am also moved by the ancient, wise philosophy of indigenous peoples and first peoples who view the earth as belonging to no one, a gift to be shared and protected. It is this philosophy that informs their notion of communal ownership of land and title. Who are we to place artificial barriers to exclude others from God's earth? 
Moreover, the 1951 Convention and other international treaties on refugees view this issue within the framework of basic notions of human rights, including rights to dignity, liberty, equality, non-discrimination, and family life. What has been Trinidad and Tobago's response to date? In the absence of laws as required by our ratification of the convention, we have formulated a cabinet-approved 2014 policy. That's very good, very laudable, but failed to implement it. Not so good. Moreover, far from emphasizing basic human rights, we have become hardline and hardened, imprisoning and deporting refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants, often with no adequate interrogation of the risks that they face, thereby criminalizing them. In doing so, we have violated the most basic norms of refugee law, that is, not to penalize such persons and the requirements of reforma, prohibiting their return to real risk situations. Asylum is grounded on real risk, fear of persecution, and so on, but we have turned a blind eye. In fact, at a restorative justice session which the faculty co-hosted two weeks ago, I learned that our prison population has increased dramatically since this new policy, including remand prisoners. It has increased threefold because of refugees, migrants, and so being thrown into prison. It is ironic that while we criticize the horrendous US policy of separating from children, children from parents, we have no idea what happens here and whether we have a clear policy and practice to prevent such atrocities. Indeed, it is not apparent that the gender dimensions of our refugee policy and future law have even been considered. For example, in the case of Naidiki and Eiji, it was the Privy Council that had to intervene to prevent a child from being separated from a father, a Nigerian who was being deported from TNT. While it is true that Trinidad and Tobago does not wish to be, quote, a refugee camp, unquote, equally, equally we cannot be insular and inhumane. Are we any better than those we now criticize? What kind of policy is appropriate? Certainly we are guided by the 1951 Convention, the protocol and related instruments. However, a country can go beyond these and speak to issues pertinent to us and our CARICOM region. For example, these treaties do not reference economic circumstances as an explicit ground for asylum or refugee status. Creative ways have had to be found to include economic status, such as discrimination provisions. But I make no apology for saying that these conventions are in some respects compromises and are informed by discriminatory tendencies. Excluding economic circumstances as a ground for asylum was no accident in my view. It was a deliberate weapon to keep out the most vulnerable countries, which intended or not are typically non-white countries. In CARICOM, we can elevate the standard to better address our own realities. We have not had a history of religious or political persecution, for example, but we do live in uncertain economic climates. Don't we have obligations here? After Hurricane Maria, I wrote to the Prime Minister asking him to take in Dominican children in our schools, and I was pleased that he did so. This was not new since OECS countries have been doing this for their neighbors for a long time, and most Trinidadians approved of this humanitarian gesture. It is for these reasons that I believe that we should also be considering this question widely to include migrants. Thinking of our future direction requires us to appreciate the various aspects of this issue. This week I heard His Grace the Archbishop declare that the church is starting a refugee program and asking us to have compassion for refugees. I was very pleased. However, during the last two weeks, the same Archbishop Gordon and other church leaders spoke out against brothers and sisters in the LGBT community. I wondered whether these church seniors understood that many persons seek asylum because of persecution for their sexual orientation.
In several instances, it is our CARICOM citizens who have sought and found refuge abroad because of persecution on account of their LGBTI or HIV status. So will we turn away asylum seekers seeking refuge who have been beaten to the pulp because of their sexual orientation, as occurs already in our region? Will we turn away young persons seeking refuge because their parents have put them out of their homes because of their LGBT status, as recently occurred right here in Trinidad and Tobago after the Jason Jones judgment? These situations will test our very humanity. The Archbishop's stance reminded me of the interconnectedness, not only of nations, but also of the various themes under refugee policy. Compassion is certainly needed for refugees, but compassion cannot be selective. Human rights are indivisible, a rich tapestry of rights. We cannot cherry pick rights and freedoms for some groups, but not for others. As a fairly good Catholic, I asked the Archbishop and other church leaders to consider this, even as they embrace the notion of rights and compassion for refugees. We must consider what will be the shape and color of our refugee policy and law. In moving forward, I hope that Trinidad and Tobago and the region will work with the citizenry to fashion the right direction. We are not fighting each other on this issue. There's need for transparency and understanding. The faculty was recently asked to make comments about uh, detention and so on, and we asked for permission to visit this, the centers, but it seems that nobody is getting permissions anymore. We have sort of locked down. So there's some timidity because the public is beginning to talk. I think this is the wrong approach. Let us work together. Our collective purpose is to provide guidance and meaningful change. It affects all of us. The context of this panel discussion is the faculty's new human rights project that we bid for and won, entitled Strengthening Trinidad and Tobago's Human Rights Capacity Through Innovative Legal Education Delivery. It is birthed and raised within the very notion of scholarly activism that I referenced earlier, a two-year project funded by the European Development Fund through the Ministry of Education. What we are doing here is working toward the development of our broader vision, which is an international human rights clinic, enabling the faculty to concretize and empower its relationship with NGOs, like-minded organizations, and attorneys in an innovative education model to enhance human rights. The topics are refugees, persons deprived of liberty, children's rights, disability, and indigenous peoples. We have actually been working on refugees for a while, since 2014. We've had a one panel discussion in 2014. We also had two trainings partnering with UNHCR and the Living Waters for NGOs uh, in 2015. 